Hey friends, I'm Stacy, and this is Gorgeously Aging, and today we are going to talk about my gastric sleeve journey. I have had so many of you reach out to me asking me specific questions about the process leading up to the surgery, insurance benefits, if I self-paid, if I had regrets, what kind of testing I had, and if I paid out of pocket, and tons of really great questions that are important to consider before going into a gastric sleeve surgery. In today's video, I'm going to cover everything, all the little teeny tiny details, and if I miss anything, you can ask me in the comment section below. I will always be 100% transparent and honest with you guys, so don't be afraid to ask. So for those of you finding this video who maybe don't know what a gastric sleeve surgery is, it's a surgery usually done laparoscopically, sometimes robotically, that removes a portion of your stomach to assist with weight loss. Now I'm an almost 53 year old grandmother of three, mother of four, and a survivor of thyroid cancer. I have a very sluggish metabolism and I also lost a son to death and that put me into a really severe period of depression and grief. And during that time, I gained a lot of weight. I got to a point that my blood pressure was really high and I was starting to have signs of being pre-diabetic and I really wanted to take my health and my life back. Now, certainly people can take their life and health back without going through a gastric sleeve surgery. But for me, I felt really strongly that this was going to be the best option for me after a ton of research. I had been on the diet hamster wheel time and time again. I had done keto, I had done carnivore, I had done GLP-1 injections, I had done everything, you name it, I had tried it. For me, the weight loss was always very slow and almost impossible to maintain. In my situation, I've never had a true food addiction. Of course, periodically I would like comfort foods, I just gain weight very easily and I have a really hard time keeping it off. I am a postmenopausal woman and I don't have a thyroid. Now I'm not making excuses. I definitely made some poor choices and during the time that I was grieving the loss of my son, I was very sedentary. I could barely get out of the bed just to work and provide for my family. I take full responsibility for the weight that I gained and for the poor choices that I made during that time. I am giving myself some grace because beating myself up for that is gonna do no good. So getting back to the gastric sleeve, they do remove part of your stomach. It is then stitched up and you are left with a sleeve-shaped portion of the stomach. The volume of this new stomach pouch is much less than it was before. This is a big commitment. It is a non-reversible type of surgery. So once it's done, you don't get your stomach back. There is also a very big commitment to pre and post surgery dietary rules and restrictions. You have to be truly ready to change your dietary habits. And for those with maybe more severe obesity than I was dealing with, really confronting the food addiction and the emotional component of this is very important. For me, it was very important as well because I was dealing with a lot of grieving and in that grieving, I was comfort eating and not taking care of myself or my health. So it all started with a consultation. I didn't know if I was a candidate for gastric sleeve surgery or what it would cost via insurance or out of pocket. I pretty much knew that my insurance, which is terrible because I'm self-employed, would not pay for the surgery. So I knew it would probably be a self-pay situation. I just didn't know if I had the BMI to qualify, if I would be seen as having enough health risks or being overweight enough to have a gastric sleeve surgery. So I really needed the expertise of my surgeon and the advice of that team to lead me in the right direction. In the consultation, it was determined that with my high blood pressure and some other health issues and my weight that I was a candidate for the surgery. The cost out of pocket for me was about $13,000 and part of that included repair of a hiatal hernia. After the consultation, there were some testing that I had to go through including blood test, abdominal ultrasound, and an upper endoscopy and that endoscopy would determine whether I was a candidate for the gastric sleeve or gastric bypass. I really didn't want to go the gastric bypass route. In my research, for me, I thought the gastric sleeve was a better option, so I was hoping that everything looked fine in my GI tract, and the endoscopy, where they stick a camera down your throat and look at your esophagus and down into your stomach, I was hoping that that would reveal that everything was okay to proceed. When I had the upper endoscopy, they did discover that I had the hiatal hernia and that that would need a repair. 
There were some signs of acid that had been present in my esophagus, but nothing to the point that it excluded me from having the gastric sleeve surgery. When having my abdominal ultrasound, they did find a mass on my liver, and after more testing, it was determined that that mass was a hemangioma which is a non-cancerous tumor on the liver. It's basically a cluster of blood vessels. And so we're just gonna keep an eye on that. From my understanding, it's nothing to worry about. In some cases, insurance will pay for bariatric surgery. The advantage of that obviously is that they pay for this and you don't have to worry about the financial burden. The disadvantage is most insurance companies have a very strict set of guidelines that you have to go through in order to qualify. Because I was going through self-pay, there were some things my surgeon required me to do, but I didn't have to wait the year time frame that many insurance companies require. So I did have to participate in a few group Zoom sessions with other potential bariatric patients. And during these sessions, we talked about nutrition, lifestyle, and other aspects of a weight loss journey and how to be successful post-surgery. I also met one-on-one -on -one with a dietitian and a psychologist for a psych consult, and they go through a bunch of different things just to determine that you are a good candidate for the surgery. All these things happened pretty quickly for me because I was doing a self-pay program. For those who are having insurance pay for the surgery, this is usually stretched out over a little bit more time, in many cases a full year. The last appointment that I had with my dietitian before surgery was a one-hour Zoom appointment going over the dietary guidelines. They called it a binder class, going through the whole binder step-by-step, week-by-week. The worst thing that can happen is that somebody comes home from surgery and eats solid food and just completely ignores the dietary requirements to heal properly. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get going into the video about what I ate and drank and what I'm eating now four months later. I'll also show you guys some before and afters and some things I didn't expect going through this process. Hang with me in this video because I have a lot of helpful information for you. After the one hour nutritional appointment, I had a pre-op appointment to go over blood work again. The surgery date was scheduled and the nurse walked me through what to expect on surgery day. They were absolutely fantastic. I had my surgery in Denver, Colorado. I'll list my surgeon's name and phone number in the comments below. So two weeks prior to the surgery was an all liquid diet. I thought this would be a lot harder than it was. Basically you're drinking protein shakes. I drank the Fairlife chocolate shakes pretty much for two weeks. You do drop a little weight then, but the reason you do that is to prepare your body, clean out your system for surgery, and also reduce the size of your liver. This helps gain better access to the stomach area. It's really important to follow that liquid diet before surgery. Now, every surgeon has different rules and requirements, so yours may look different than mine. Now, I won't say that that liquid diet leading up to surgery was easy by any means. You know, you do see other people eating food, you have cravings, but I was so looking forward to changing my life and being successful with this that I really didn't find it to be terrible to do the liquid diet. So on surgery day, you're gonna go in with an empty stomach. Of course, no eating or drinking before surgery for several hours. Every surgeon's a little bit different. I had a wonderful nurse who kind of walked me through everything. I knew what to expect, but she really put my nerves at ease. She did remind me there was gonna be some discomfort after surgery. She didn't wanna sugarcoat it, and I appreciated that. I knew I was gonna wake up and have some discomfort. And so I think going into it, knowing that you're doing something that's pretty major as far as removing a portion of your stomach and there will be some discomfort following surgery. So immediately after surgery, while I was in the hospital, they did keep me comfortable with pain meds through my IV and they also get you sipping water pretty quickly. It's important for them to see that you can drink an appropriate amount of water or liquids before going home. In that first 24 hours, I only drank clear liquid, which was water and chicken broth. Following that, for two weeks, I drank water, chicken broth, Crystal Light, and Fairlife protein drinks. Small amounts sipping throughout the day about every two hours, making sure that we're focusing on getting enough protein in the system. I didn't find this hard at all because the stomach is still healing and I didn't want to overload my stomach, so I really had no solid food cravings during that time. But as I get closer to that two-week being on liquids post-surgery, mind you, I had two weeks before and then two weeks after, so it was a month of liquid, basically. 
by the end of that two-week period, I was really looking forward to doing pureed foods and soft foods. So there is a progression. You go from liquid to pureed to soft foods and then start to ease into more normal foods. The discomfort in my stomach lasted for the first week to two weeks, but each day it got better and better. So I noticed it like, like when I tried to turn in bed or if I stood up too fast. And so I really just took it easy. I did walk around the house a little bit during that first few weeks to get some exercise and gradually moved that outside, but usually had somebody with me for support. I found for me personally, I was a little lightheaded in those first few weeks, so I really wasn't wanting to go outside and walk without somebody with me. The big reminder is listen to your body. Don't push yourself. If you're not feeling up to a, a walk, then don't walk. Maybe just walk around the house, but do try to get up and move around. Now for me personally, because I followed the diet to the letter, I really didn't have much or any nausea. I had a few waves of nausea here and there, but I've never vomited. And still to this day, four months later, I haven't vomited since surgery. And I don't have constant bouts of nausea. I make sure that I'm eating no more than half a cup in one setting. And now four months later, I can tell if I overeat even by just a spoonful or more. It's just a full feeling that makes me feel like I wanna burp. And so you start to learn your, your body's new normal and what is too much for your stomach size. I had to remind myself in those first two weeks after surgery that it was temporary and my stomach was still healing. Remember, a major organ in your body has been partially removed and so everything needs to heal inside. Four months later, I have no pain or residual side effects from surgery other than not being able to eat as much. The one exception to that is that the regaining of energy is a slow process. Your body is metabolizing food differently, you're processing food differently, and you're not consuming as many calories as you used to. So it does take a while for your body to shift into this new normal. And especially when you're having just liquids or pureed foods, you're definitely not getting many calories at all to fuel you you start to have more energy as you shift into eating more solid foods. I found that getting a good night's sleep and doing my best to make sure I was sleeping well was super important to my healing and also weight loss. Weight loss really does require you to get a good night's sleep, so focus on sleep if you can. It wasn't uncommon for me to take a nap in the middle of the day for a couple of hours when I needed it, and sometimes that made all the difference in my mood, in the way I felt, and when I hit a weight loss plateau, getting those little extra naps in made a difference. It also made a difference to get a little more movement in my day. And after the first six weeks, I started lifting weights, not crazy, not heavy, and not for a long duration, but I did start lifting weights and I'm starting to see the payoff in my arms. So someone asked about resuming intimacy. You know, there was no hard and fast rule with my doctor. Just, they said, use your best discretion as far as letting things heal and not being in pain. So I think for me, it was maybe like three weeks. So for those who wanna know that aspect of it, it really from person to person, when you're feeling better, when you're not in pain, when you feel up to it, but definitely check with your doctor. So the dietary progression, starting with your liquids for two weeks and then moving to pureed foods for a week and then soft foods like cottage cheese, scrambled eggs, things like that that are soft and easy to go into the stomach and then moving on to introducing more solid foods into the diet. The things that I eat mostly are pretty repetitive because it's comfortable for me. I eat Greek yogurt, I eat scrambled eggs, I love chicken breast that's well seasoned, sometimes with a side of a vegetable, but I don't like to put too much fibrous vegetables into my system because they'll take up so much space in the stomach when you really need to focus on the protein. So I always eat the protein first. I've had some oatmeal. I like to eat cottage cheese, cheese, really high quality lunch meats. And I'll just put that oftentimes in a piece of cheese and fold it up like a little taco. And it's not that I'm opposed to eating any carbohydrates. I'm just finding the most success when I'm reducing carbohydrates or making sure the carbohydrates I do eat are vegetables or oatmeal. I'm really not eating any bread, tortilla, pasta. And if I do, it's maybe just one bite. When you've been focusing on protein for a while, you don't miss the carbs and sugar at all. You really start to get used to this new way of eating. If I crave a carb, it maybe would be like black beans with some chicken or rice with some chicken, but I don't do it very often. 
I do really like a hamburger patty with a little bit of light mayo and ketchup and just focus on eating the hamburger patty with no bun. Certainly you could add vegetables or lettuce or onions, whatever you like. Pretty much any meat on the grill or any meat I can eat now that I'm four months in, you know, that's a great way to get protein if you're not a vegetarian or vegan. I absolutely love my Greek yogurts, and so I tend to eat a couple of those a day. That might be my pre-breakfast, followed by two scrambled eggs a few hours later. I might have some good quality lunch meat folded into a piece of cheese for lunch, followed by another Greek yogurt later in the afternoon, and maybe half a chicken breast for dinner. Periodically, I will have a protein drink still, but I'm trying to focus on food rather than getting all my protein and calorie calories from liquids. So somebody asked me about grieving the loss of that stomach and feeling sadness or depression after surgery. I think this can happen, and I had a few days of sadness, but it wasn't grieving eating, and it wasn't grieving what might happen down the road or how my life might be not centered around food or eating the same amount of food as other people. I think it was just kind of healing from the surgery, feeling a little bit emotional because I was worried about regaining energy and feeling good again, but I assure you after a couple weeks when things are healed, you feel so much better. Not everything is completely healed within two weeks, but that for me was kind of the turning point when things started feeling a lot better. So I reminded myself that even though I was feeling better, you really still have to be careful because the full healing is going to take a while. So there may be some grieving and mourning the loss of the stomach and the loss of that old comfort eating, especially for someone who has a true food addiction, and that's something to take very seriously. Processing those emotions, those habits, and that comfort and friendship some people feel, that relationship with food, it's something to really think about before jumping into this journey. This surgery is a very safe surgery. In fact, my surgeon said it's no more risky than having your gallbladder removed, but it is still something to really take seriously and consider. It's a surgery. I think for anybody going through this type of surgery, it's important to really be honest with ourselves about our relationship with food and how we can cope with the things that we're using food to comfort us. How could I cope with the grief of my son without turning to food as comfort? You know, how can you, as someone considering gastric sleeve surgery, cope with the things that you're masking with food? So finding other ways to cope and finding that comfort in new and healthy ways is so important. So another thing to consider is the expense of new clothes. So I prepared for this, I did have savings, I paid out of pocket for my surgery, and I have repurchased pretty much a whole new wardrobe. I kept a few pieces that kind of work for me, baggy, like some sweatpants that I can still wear around the house, but literally most of my clothes now are not fitting. Four months in, I'm down 55 pounds, my body looks completely different, I'm getting a lot more exercise, and I'm feeling so much better. My blood pressure is completely back to normal. My health has just improved so much, I can't even tell you guys. So there will be that expense, but there's also other ways besides rebuying all clothes. You can borrow from people, hit up some great thrift stores. And you know, the thing is, is if you have a lot of weight to lose, you don't want to repurchase a whole wardrobe for every size because you're going to be moving into new sizes. I think like the first 40 pounds that I lost, I didn't buy anything new. Now that I'm over 50 pounds, I've pretty much changed my whole wardrobe. And the other thing is finding your style again. For me, during that those two years of grieving the loss of my son, I had always been into fashion and looking nice, and I completely let that go, and I lived in comfy clothes. And I just really lost my sense of style, and so I'm rediscovering that, and that takes time. So I'm buying some pieces that the old, thinner me would have loved, but now I'm like not so sure if that's where I want to be with my style. So the expense of repurchasing a wardrobe, but also not going crazy with new clothes until you get to where you really feel like you can stabilize and make that investment in a smart way. One of the things that surprised me is that you're going to have so much love and support around you, but you're also going to have haters and people who criticize. People who think that you have no self-control, people who think it's an easy way out. And let me tell you, it's a really huge commitment. My hat's off and huge love for those who've gone through bariatric surgery and made the changes you needed to make to take your life back. It is not easy. Like any change in life, it takes so much strength 
commitment and focus to be successful. There are people who have bariatric surgery and gastric sleeve who lose weight initially but regain the weight back. They haven't dealt with the emotional connection to food and some people will opt for a revision surgery because they've stretched that stomach out again. I'm committed to not doing that and to following the guidelines specifically to avoid weight regain, which is something for me that I'm terrified of. I don't want to put in all this work, go through a surgery, pay the money, and have the weight come back on. So I think people think that gastric surgery is a magic bullet or the easy way out, but you still have to put in the work. There will be people out there who are not happy for you, who are jealous of the happiness that this brings you, the improved health that this brings you, and that you're feeling good about yourself. There will be people who liked you better fat. And that's really unfortunate. In some ways, you have to learn to move on and surround yourself with people who support you and who lift you up. And sadly, in some cases, those people are family members who liked the old you, who don't want to see you healthy and thriving and thinner. There may be somebody in your life who has enabled you and you being in that position brought something to their life. Maybe it be the role of a caretaker or maybe they felt superior to you in some way. I'm not a psychologist, so certainly I can get into the psychological aspects of all of these relationships that are surrounding you. But definitely consider that and don't let anybody sabotage your success. Whether you are losing weight naturally or whether you're doing it through the assistance of a gastric sleeve or bypass surgery. The people who truly love you will support you being healthy and having the kind of life that you've always craved. Something I'd like to remind you of is that loving yourself through the entire phase from beginning to end, loving yourself at every weight, loving yourself at every emotional roadblock, give yourself grace not just in a weight loss journey, but in general. In most cases, people find themselves contemplating weight loss surgery. It isn't just the love of food. There are other emotional aspects, feeling of self-loathing, lack of self-esteem, and trauma, deep, deep trauma in their lives that have brought them to this place. Giving yourself love and grace and understanding that you're worthy of being your best self. You're worthy of being healthier and you're worthy of feeling beautiful. All these things are important and I have to remind myself of them a lot. Just always remember to be good to yourself. This is not an easy journey. We make mistakes along the way and we get back up, forgive ourselves and move forward. If I have any other questions come in, I will definitely leave the answers to those questions in the first pinned comment. And like I said, feel free to ask any question down in the comment section below. I'm happy to help. Thank you so very much for watching. If you haven't already, I'd love for you to join the Gorgeously Aging community by subscribing to my channel. You can keep up to date on my weight loss progress. I'll definitely be posting a lot of before and afters and a lot of my little mini workouts I do at home, which have been so helpful. For me, it's not enough just to lose weight. I definitely want to feel healthy and I want to have longevity and good health moving through my 50s and into my 60s. Again, thank you so much for being here. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and consider sharing it with a friend. I'll see you guys next time. Mm -hmm.